Hi, I'm Phil Constantine, and this is a brief biography of Charles M. Duke Jr., American astronaut from the Earth to the Moon and back. Yes, it is a biography in his own words. Mostly, obviously, I'm speaking to you right now, but mostly we're going to be having Charlie tell you about various spots in his life. He was born in 1935 in North Carolina. He went to the U.S. Naval Academy and was also in the Air Force. He was a fighter pilot and instructor. As a master's from MIT, he was capsule communicator on Apollo 11. And while Charlie may not be very well-known person, he was part of the biggest history event in the world. Right. But the one thing, people may have heard your voice. They may not remember your name, but they've heard your voice. Because when Neil Armstrong landed, do you remember what you said? I do. Yeah, that was indelibly ingrained in my mind. Uh, after a few seconds after they touched down, uh, Neil said, uh, Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And I responded with, uh, with such excitement I couldn't even pronounce twain. Uh, I said Twainquility. I, uh, no, and now I corrected myself. Said, Roger, Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Absolutely. So you are part of that special event. All of history. It really was special. Right. Charlie Moss Duke Jr. was born on October 3rd, 1935 in Charlotte, North Carolina. I didn't have a dream about going to the astronaut, being an astronaut. There wasn't any astronauts when I grew up. And he and his twin brother, Bill, enjoyed making airplane models when they were kids. And that is sort of where he got some of his interest in aircraft, although he probably made models because he liked aircraft already. So flying did interest him when he was a young man. But I remember in high school, I looked up and I saw a jet contrail go over. And I said, man, that'd be great to make a contrail. Maybe I ought to be a pilot. I decided to go to the Naval Academy because that's what where my dad was. Well, he did not go there, but that's why he had been in the Navy. So I chose the Naval Academy. I went off to prep school uh, to get prepared uh, for that event. And uh, when I got to NASA, uh, when I got to the Naval Academy in uh, 1953, uh, started my uh, four years there. Uh, during the time I was there, I fell in love with airplanes. Decided that. Uh, I wanted to be a pilot, and uh, I had a choice. It was naval aviation, and back then there wasn't an Air Force Academy, so you could volunteer to go to the Air Force from the Naval Academy, and they'd allow 25% of that class to do that. Uh, so uh, I volunteered, uh, not really. I, I decided, uh, well, what, what should I do, naval aviation or Air Force? And my senior year, uh, my uh, physical, uh, the doctor gave me my physical, uh, at the end of it he said, uh, Mitch M. and Duke, uh, you have astigmatism in your right eye and you don't qualify for naval aviation, but the Air Force will take you. So, <laughs> so off I, I raised my right hand and was sworn in as second lieutenant of the Air Force. Charlie was a fighter pilot based at Ramstein Air Base in West Germany, then attended the Aerospace Research Pilot School and became an instructor. I'd soloed like uh, late September 1957 on the 4th of October, one day after my birthday, Sputnik went up. Beginning, in my mind, the beginning of the space age. There's a satellite going beep, 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 beep around. And that got our attention as a nation. We couldn't put one up. We tried, kept blowing up. Five, four, three, two, one, blow up, rather than lift up. The Air Force said Charlie should go to MIT to get his master's degree in 1962. I was just loving my job as an Air Force, uh, Air Force pilot, but in 1962, NASA said, not NASA, but Air Force said, we want you to go back to graduate school. But I got another year over here. I could stay another year. And they said, no, we'd like you to go. And so I had this urge, yeah, go, go to graduate school. So I left this good job in Germany and ended up uh, at graduate school at MIT. Uh, and at that point, uh, the Apollo program was beginning to get going. And MIT had the instrumentation lab. They had the contract to build the Apollo guidance and navigation system. 
So uh, when I got time to my master's thesis, they had built this system, but they didn't know whether a pilot could work it or not. So they had several of us in graduate school, so they said, well, you can help us and do your thesis on this, on this system. So I did, and while I was over there doing this for six months, I met some the current astronauts. And I'd never met anybody that was so excited about their job than this guy, these guys. So I said, how do I get that job? And uh, so uh, I, uh, they said, well, you gotta f finish your degree, go to test pilot school, and then you might have a chance. So that was my plan after I got my degree to go to test pilot school. And I got selected for test pilot school and went to Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, this was in the summer of 1964. My wife Dottie and I had gotten married the summer before, June 63, and so we loaded up our little Chevy Monza and drove to Edwards Air Force Base, which is in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Fighter pilot's dream place. You know, all these airplanes I'm gonna get to fly. Dottie cried for three weeks. It's in the <laughs> desert, you know, and 35 miles to Sears and Roebuck. And, <laughs> you know, we went to church. We went to church, and then we had to drive all the way into Lancaster, another 35 miles, just to go to church. Applying to be an astronaut in 1965. I read an article in the front page of the Los Angeles Times. NASA's looking for more astronauts. Please apply. Literally, uh, and. Uh, and so I applied and got selected along with three other guys in my test pilot school and several other guys from Edwards. These are Charlie's group of astronauts. You can see them there on the bottom, left third. Uh, our group bubbled up into this mix of astronauts. We had about 42 astronauts that were quite flight qualified. And we uh, started training. And uh, I got, as you heard, was uh, Capcom for Apollo 11. Before that, Capcom for Apollo 10. So let's look at the Apollo 11 landing. Charlie Duke, you see here on the left, it was the capsule communicator called Capcom. And normally, there only one person talks directly to the astronauts during any flight, and this was him on Apollo 11, the first landing. Down, straight shadow, four forward, four forward, drift into the right a little. Ready? Down and a half, 30 seconds. Forward, drift. Okay. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Charlie Duke wiping his head. Very smooth touchdown. So that's Charlie Duke, Jim Lovell, sitting next to him. And here's a comment from him 40 years later. But the one thing, people may have heard your voice. They may not that's remember me. your name, but they've heard your voice. Because when Neil Armstrong landed, you remember what you said? I do. Yeah, that was indelibly ingrained in my mind. Uh, after a few seconds after they touched down, uh, Neil said, uh, Houston, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. And I responded with... Uh, with such excitement, I couldn't even pronounce Twain. Uh, I said Twainquility, I, uh, no, and now I corrected myself. That Roger Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Absolutely. Yeah. So you are part of that special of event. Yeah, it was all really, of history. It really was special. He had a little notoriety in the movie Apollo 13. Uh, then after Apollo 11, I got put on backup crew for Apollo 13. So uh, and if you those old enough here to remember that movie that Tom Hanks did, my name is mentioned in that movie. <laughs> and it was, uh, Charlie Duke has got the measles. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that really, I mean, that poured a lot of water on Apollo 13 because I exposed everybody to the measles. and. Uh, kids get the measles, what are the astronauts getting this measles? And uh, they checked everybody, and everybody had had the measles except Ken Mattingly. And uh, he had to uh, get taken off the flight. The guy I trained with 
took his place. So let's look at his mission, Apollo 16. Anyway, after that, I went. Uh, John Young and I started training for Apollo 16 uh, with uh, now Mattingly, who was on our crew from Apollo 13. And two years later, we launched, became the fifth landing, a landing on the moon. We landed at a place called Descartes, uh, which you look at the moon, at, at a full moon, it's almost right in the center of the full moon. A little east, a little south of the center. And that was our landing spot. It was several hundred miles or more from where Neil Armstrong landed in the Sea of Tranquility. But if he landed at sea level, we landed 8,000 feet above him. Uh, uh, in relative elevation. So it was the mountains of the moon and uh, the first and only flight that landed up in the mountains of the moon and we were to explore this part of the moon and uh, we were given uh, three days on the moon. We were given an electric car called the Lunar Rover which was folded up and bolted to the outside of the spacecraft that we had to deploy. And uh, things were really, we, our landing was almost canceled because of a problem in our other spacecraft, but mission control came through and saved the day. They gave us a workaround so we could fix, not fix it, but still fly. So we landed, uh, John Young was the commander and he was flying it and I'm talking him down. Uh, and uh, we, land, we picked out a landing spot and we touched down uh, six hours behind schedule uh, but thanks to Mission Control, the heroes of Apollo was Mission Control. They saved the day on just about every Apollo flight. Exploring the moon. Uh, we spent three days exploring. The moon was exciting. It was uh, stark, barren. Buzz Aldrin called it magnificent desolation. Uh, and you stood there on this, this gray surface, and it was very, very fine like powder. And everywhere you walked, you left your footprints. So you never get worried about getting lost up on the moon. <laughs> Even though we drove our car four miles away, if you really didn't know where you were, just turn around and follow your tracks back. You can't see the stars. Whenever the sun's shining in space, you don't see the stars. You just have black. And uh, now on Mars, you had to, you'd have a red sky because they have an atmosphere, but there's no atmosphere on the moon. And so it's a, it's a black sky. Charlie describes his flight. Here's our launch uh, on a Saturn V. Uh, it's uh, 363 feet tall, 33 feet in diameter, and weighed six and a half million pounds when it lifted off. I found out later from the flight surgeon, uh, my heartbeat was 144 at liftoff. I mean, I was really excited. And, uh, <laughs> John had flown the Apollo 10 Saturn V, and I said, well, what was his heartbeat? He said, 70. And so, <laughs> so you can see who the uh, cool one was. Landing on the moon. And now we pitch over. We're 7,000 feet above the moon, and we recognize these two big black uh, holes, these craters. So John picks out a landing site. You can see the moon is rough. It's not easy to find a landing site up there. As Buzz Aldrin said, about 30, 40 feet, we start picking up the moon dust. It's like blowing uh, dust all over. And uh, you shut the engine down about four feet above the moon, and then you drop in, and the dust clears instantly because there's no atmosphere to swirl the dust around. We're screaming and shouting, you know, we're here, Houston, and fantastic, and all those things. And so looking to the south, uh, we see this mountain down there called Stone Mountain. It was very dark in the shadow, you can see, but, uh, 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 but very bright on the, on the, in the, uh, on the surface. Uh, our cameras were not digital. I'm putting a film canister on my Hasselblad camera that's attached to my spacesuit. It had dust on it, so I'm sitting there <laughs> blowing the dust off. Well, that didn't work, of course. <laughs> And I realized what I was doing. I said, you idiot. <laughs> so we put up the flag. And then I got in position. And John Young comes out to get a, 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 his picture taken. And I said, come on out, John. Give me a big salute, big Navy salute. So he waddles out. And uh, here he comes. And uh, 
he gets ready and I say, okay, give me a big salute. And so he gets a big jump and off the moon he goes and salutes. There's the actual picture. Uh, and if, if you think the flag is holding out there because it's a strong wind, it's a curtain rod holding it out. So <laughs> there is no atmosphere on the moon. Whoops again. This is my most embarrassing moment. I left, I'm the guy that just disappeared off to the right side. And uh, so this TV camera is controlled by an engineer in Houston. And so he's picking me up. I'm carrying $10 million worth of experiments and they fall off. <laughs> and I looked at the TV to see if they were, I wasn't gonna fess up if they weren't seeing me, but they, they saw it and I had to fess up. Fortunately, in one six gravity, they, did, they weighed 10 pounds or something like that. So they, they weren't hurt at all. The Rover Grand Prix. I'm taking this picture of our Rover. Uh, we call it the Grand Prix. Uh, John is uh, bouncing along and you can see it was a, a rough ride uh, up on the moon. Uh, here's what it looked like from on board. Getting up when you fall down is not easy. Well, I'm doing this experiment here, and so I push it down. It goes in farther than I expected, so I fall down. And uh, now you got to get up. So uh, you get in position, and you get ready for a push-up. So you push, and that doesn't quite do it, so you rock up and push again. And <laughs> it took about three pushes to get up. Maneuvering on the moon is not easy either. So sometimes you had to collect yourself by yourself, and here I am trying to <laughs> collect this rock. It didn't go very well. So uh, I, I was determined, though, and I'm going to get this rock. So here we go again. I pitch it up real slowly, and I catch it this time, but I dropped a bag I was putting it in. So. <laughs> The Olympic high jump on the moon. And here is the high jump. Uh, I'm the guy on the left here. John, we were going to do the moon Olympics, and there I go. Unfortunately, I fall over backwards. <laughs> and that's really scary, because if that backpack breaks, I'm dead. So I had fear, but I, fear is not a bad emotion if you don't panic. And so do something. So I rolled right and broke my fall on my right side, bounced onto my back. And my heart's pounding, but I'm still alive. And John looks down and says, that wasn't very smart, Charlie. <laughs> I said, yeah, help me up. So uh, he helped me up. Things left on the moon. So we left our car up there. So if you want an $8 million car with a dead battery, uh, there's three up there. I left a picture of my family up on the moon. Our boys were five and seven at the time. This is a close-up of that picture he, Charlie left on the moon. And lift off from the moon itself. And uh, so we left the car with the TV camera going. And here we go in lift off. And the camera follows us right up to the maximum elevation of the camera. It took seven and a half minutes uh, to get back into orbit. It took about an hour to rendezvous. Uh, and uh, with the command module who had stayed in orbit 60 miles above the moon. Splash down in the Pacific. Really the, one of the most beautiful sights uh, you can ever see in Apollo, because without the parachutes, you crash uh, and are killed. So uh, we had three good parachutes, and we were right near our uh, landing spot. We were talking to the carrier, a uh, helicopter flies by, and I look at it out of my window, and we get ready for splashdown. And uh, <clears throat> it was really crash down, though. Uh, we hit really hard, and uh, I was, my head was out of position. I whopped the back of the seat. I didn't go unconscious, but I was a little groggy. So if you watch the left side, the chute on the left side, it stayed inflated and, pit, and flipped us over upside down. So now the hatch is underwater, and we're hanging upside down in our suits, uh, in our uh, seats. Uh, and uh, we had some big balloons uh, that are now underwater, and we pumped these big balloons up, and it flipped us back over, uh, up right side up. I was the youngest man to walk on the moon, and at 85, I'm still the youngest man to walk on the moon. <laughs> 
Would you like to go back? I walked on the moon. It took three days. I'd love to go back to the moon, but 85, NASA's not going to call me. Charlie and his wife Dottie have a ministry called Duke Ministry for Christ. You can find their website, and they do lots of speaking. And, uh, one of my favorite scriptures now is Psalm 91, uh, 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of His hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night. They speak to us. What were your first and last thoughts on the moon? Uh, the first thought as I stepped onto the moon was, uh, uh, I'm on the moon, I'm on the moon. And, uh, and, uh, fi you know, finally made it. And, uh, and I guess the last thought was uh, uh, when I, I, I dropped a picture of my family on the moon. And that was one of the last things I did. I took a picture of the picture. And uh, so promise to the family fulfilled. Our family was on the moons together. What's your, what's your favorite memory from being on the moon? Uh, I think one of the favorites is the landing, you know, being mm -hmm. a pilot, a fighter pilot, test pilot before I came astronaut, you know, you know, make good landings is always nice. And so John and I were coming into an area that was real rough. And so... Uh, we were able to get it set it down, so the dynamics of the lining was very exciting. And another memory I have was we, on the second day, we drove our car up the side of a little place called Stone Mountain, it's about mm -hmm. four miles away from our land spot. And we were able to turn around and look out across this magnificent valley of the Cayley Plains, and it was uh, just breathtaking. Right. Yeah. So that, that memory is really vivid. Absolutely. Now, what's your favorite story after you came back? Experiences from being back and just experiencing the, you know, all the kind of folks who want to come up here and shake your hand and meet you. Do you have any favorite experiences based on that? Uh, well, there are quite a few, yeah, uh, after we got back. Uh, you know, astronauts are very rarely recognized as celebrities. You know, we did a lot uh, for the country, but we, when we were on TV, we were always in spacesuits, you know, so nobody ever recognized you. But the other day, uh, I had a very wonderful experience. This guy stopped me in the, in the Crown Club at Atlanta Airport, and he says, Are you Charlie Duke? <laughs> Says, yes, I am Charlie Duke. <laughs> he said, well, you're one of my heroes. And I said, well, you're the first guy in 37 years that's recognized me. <laughs> well, good for him. Yeah, so, you know, little events like that come up, and uh, we stay very active. My wife and I travel all over. And, yeah. Um, yes. Cameraman Tom Zizzi asked him a question. Let me ask you a question. You, 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 when you see a big harvest moon coming up over the horizon, does it? Do, do you get a, a kind of a special feeling at times? Uh, yeah, big big moon comes up. Uh, the other day, we, you know, it was one of its closest approach in a long time. Uh, the moon and it, it was beautiful. We were in Texas and saw it come up, and you know that real feeling of. Uh, of wonder that I've been there, you know, came up and was just really exciting to see. And with my wife, I still get it romantic because it's still a beautiful place and uh, uh, to view from here. I have a couple of nice connections with Charlie other than working with him. Uh, I did work on his mission and I also got one as Robin Medallion. This, this little uh, coin right here is called a Robin's Medallion. Yeah. And uh, these were specially minted. Uh, they're only like, I think on your flight, like 200 yeah. of these uh -huh. around there. Right. And oddly enough, on an auction house, I, I got this from his collection here. Yeah. So it's transferred hands there. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy it. I yeah. do. Yeah, I good. Do. Yeah, those are very special, as a matter yeah. of fact. Yeah, mm -hmm. special mementos. Yeah. All right. Let me get a closer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And a special thanks to uh, Charlie and Rick Marshall, the senior pastor at Springton Lake Presbyterian Church, for allowing me to use some of the clips. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please feel free to make comments below as long as the language is family friendly. And if you like this video, please click on the thumbs up button below. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the circle with my picture in it in the lower right hand corner of the video. The arrow is pointing at it now. And once you have subscribed, you can be notified of when I have a new video posted by clicking on the bell icon in the description field below the video. Thanks again for watching.